Today I'm going to talk about using machine learning models in JavaScript application and I chose the name JavaScript because JavaScript can run on server, client, so many places um, and basically that's what we're going to see today. Um, I'm from Mexico, yes I have jet lag right now and um, I've been a software developer for eight years now. Um, I like to build community in my city, I'm a woman take maker from Google and I'm a curious developer. I'm not uh, an expert in AI, but uh, this is how I wanted to know. I wanted to know what was going on. Uh, AI is not new. It's been around since a long time ago, but there's a lot of hype right now, and there's a good reason to be hype right now, but there's been hype since forever. So if you think you're late to the game, you're not. This is things that are evolving constantly. So I hope with this talk, you can get um, your JavaScript skills if you want to start building things or just know what's going on the, in the JavaScript ecosystem. So for the agenda for today, just want to give some basic idea what it's AI, machine learning, and then why do we think of machine learning with JavaScript and using TensorFlow.js. Um, we're going to talk about what are models and what are uh, TensorFlow models. I'm going to show you a, a little demo using Node um, and TensorFlow.js and some use cases that we could start using them. And finally, what's new? Maybe some of you already know uh, TensorFlow and, and this talk. You can find it on many places, uh, but this is for people who haven't heard it, people who uh, already know it but want to know what's new. So I hope you enjoy this talk. And so what is AI? Uh, or artificial intelligence, this basically a science, a discipline um, that does the theory and methods to build machines that think and act like humans. So this is basically the whole idea of why we start programming, trying to build machines that are intelligent. And this is coming from the 1950s. So as I mentioned, it's nothing new, but we're in the verge of uh, an ecosystem that can make it grow so fast right now. And so today we're going to talk about machine learning. Um, there's also other concepts like deep learning, and we're not going to cover them today, but it just uh, deep learning covers more important uh, complex problems like generative AI or self-driving cars, and the difference might be basically the neural networks that they use that they emulate the biology of how we think. And so for anybody who has coded before, we usually have requirements and then we can have data that could be a database, an image, um, text, whatever. And then we have to code it to do what we want. That is how we usually program. And with machine learning, it's different because we have algorithms which we'll train to make them. So we'll give that same data that can come from a database, an image, um, text, audio. And we need to convert them first to numbers because the models and the algorithms read numbers. And then we can label them. So the machine will try, or the model, will try to find patterns to know how they can fill that requirement. That is the main difference of how we usually program. We know how to code it, but there are complex problems that we cannot do the if-else infinite uh, options. So that's why machine learning comes into play. Machine learning doesn't need to be added to every application, but there's complex problems that as programming with uh, just basic JavaScript or no, couldn't be covered. So this is where, where it comes in. And so this is just the basic line, uh, just making sure we're on the same page. And then, so, okay, so why with JavaScript? So um, most of the machine learning or deep learning, it's done in Python. And because it has a very um, big ecosystem community researchers, I, I, that's good. But also, JavaScript has a lot of community. JavaScript in Stack Overflow, um, the survey of this year, it was the 11th year with the most developers building with JavaScript. So we have a lot of people doing um, web or just doing software with JavaScript, and this is a great bridge so we can build more solutions. If so, only a few people build these solutions, we won't cover 
the whole world, right? So this is an, an effort that Google is doing to, that's why it's providing TensorFlow.js because that's a way to reach more people and so more people can contribute to uh, provide the solutions. So as I mentioned, JavaScript can run on the web. Uh, if you open a browser and a console, you will have JavaScript there. If you want a desktop application, you can use Electron. If you want uh, the server, we have Node. Uh, if you want to build up upon mobile, we have React Native uh, or progressive web apps. And then if you want to run an IoT, you could use a Raspberry Pi and put it on uh, Node. So as you can see, you could reach more places with JavaScript, something that Python cannot provide, unless you provide an API, of course, but this is running exclusively those models on these devices. And so why TensorFlow? OK, we know JavaScript is a good language, but why TensorFlow.js? It's backed up by Google. Um, they have uh, updates every year. They're definitely building upon this product. They feel there is a future on this. They definitely have a lot of advocates uh, to provide um, the knowledge so people can start building this. This library has been since 2018. And it has a great community, it's open source, so it's a great way to start building uh, models with TensorFlow. And so it encapsulates a complexity. What does this mean? Basically, there's three layers within this library. The first one is the models. There's already trained models that you can plug and play within your applications. There's another layer, which is the layers API. This is to create uh, models from scratch, so for example, um, this is something that if you want transfer learning is a way of, if I have a model, but I need to modify it for my use case, I'll use the layers API. And then there's another layer, which is the core ops API. This is more for, um, linear algebra. I'm not saying that don't use it. It would definitely be something that we will need to dive in to understand it better. But if you want to get started layers API and the models, um, layer, would be a great place for you to get started. So what can I do with TensorFlow library? I can create from scratch a model. I can retrain or train a model. If I already have it and I want to train it on this library, I can do it. And um, I can just run them. I can just put them on the device that I have it and it would run. It has a great ecosystem from NPM Every model, it's an NPM package. Um, it can be with JavaScript, it can be with Node. So that's, that's a great ecosystem. Another thing, this is exclusively if you run these models on the browser. So uh, we're dealing with a lot of information. Let's say your application needs to read a password. So if you read that password, usually most of the models run on the server. So you will need to move that image to the model running on the server and it can get compromised. But if you have that one, just reading that document on your browser, it's not sending it every, anywhere. So it just read it and infer, you know, yeah, it's okay or whatever classification you use for that model. If it's a diagnosis, that's also very important data and very private. So it's another uh, great thing. And or just reading any legal document, um, talking about privacy, this is very important for us to manipulate. So it, it's a win in, if you run it on the browser. The next one is the latency. Yes, we have TensorFlow on the server. And as I mentioned, most of the models run on the server. But if you run it on your browser or on your mobile or on your IoT device, you have the access to webcam. You have the access of a microphone or whatever device. If it has a sensor, you have that available. What does this bring? This brings more solutions, more creative. There's actually a lot of um, demos out there from creative people because they have access. You know, it's easier to grab a phone or something instead of just uh, your, your laptop. So this creates more creative solutions. So this is a great, uh, I'd say, uh, benefit of using it. This is on the, on the browser. Less cost. So, well, you don't have to have one computer running that server model, or you don't need to pay it if you're paying for it. Uh, if it's from the browser, it's already there. You just have the web page, right? So it's 
not that expensive because actually running those is expensive. And the benefit that it can be offline, if you have it on your browser, if your page already loaded, you have access to that model. So if you have low connectivity or in a place where uh, you might need it to use it offline, once the, the application is loaded, you can have access to that model. It doesn't need to go to the server to run uh, any inference. So these are the benefits of running TensorFlow.js. And so I talk a lot about models, but what are models? So uh, as I mentioned, models can be run um, with TensorFlow.js. Models, you can retrain them if you need to add something for your specific case, just write them from scratch. Um, TensorFlow has a big ecosystem in the library, which means that you can have uh, models from TensorFlow, models from MediaPipe, and all of this can get translated to TensorFlow.js. So it's the only library that can digest um, other models. So that's why we have a broad variety of models that we could use or translate to deploy them on the browser or on the server. And how do you train this model? So there's, on machine learning, there's very popular ways to train models. Um, the main ones are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and there's another one which is reinforcement, reinforcement learning. But today we're gonna just look at this too. And from supervised learning, remember I mentioned, you need to, to give data and the label. So in regression, for example, the most common example you might have already heard is that uh, if you want to predict the cost of a house and if you have that in a CSV with all the real estate data that you know three ha three a house with a three rooms and two floors can cost this and you have all of those detailed and you fit that to the model it would predict a number right because you're giving the labels of the features and then it would predict a number that is regression the difference between that one and classification is because in classification you give options. You're saying, is it spam, for example, for an email, or is it not spam? So you feed it with details, labels um, to the model, and the model will predict either a classification, if it's a classification problem, or if it's a regression problem, just a number. That's the only difference. And then on unsupervised learning, this one is very commonly used because um, you have a lot of data. We live in a, in a world where there's a lot of data right now online. And what can we predict from this? So on unsupervised learning, you're just filling the data. And there's a way to know anomaly detection. So this is very common for fraud. You may have some transactions that run in the same place. And something that doesn't match or, or it's not from the, if you graphed it, it would be out of place. So that's a way to detect fraud. And the other one is clustering, the same thing. You feel data, and this is very commonly used in e-commerce. So for example, you can find that people that like coffee buy all of these things. People that have baby um, buy all of these things. And you will see a graph within clusters. That's, that's how um, you can differentiate them. And this is unsupervised. As I mentioned, you don't give a label. You just give data. So models. What models do we have available in TensorFlow? Uh, we have vision, we have one that is Im image classification, uh, object detection, the difference between them, the object detection can detect where, and that classif classification would only let you know dog, cat, or whatever, and the object would give you where and how many. The human body, there's a lot of uh, cool demos out there for people who wanna work out and when I did the, in, in pandemic, you couldn't go to a gym. So a lot of uh, trainers created solutions where you could um, provide the right position of the body when you're working out. So as I mentioned, a lot of people that were programmers or didn't care about it needed solutions. And that's why there's a lot of demos, I guess, within pandemic, a lot of people wanted to learn. Uh, but yeah, we have body segmentation, pulse estimation, face and hand, estim hand um, Post estimation, this is used with hand language. So there's, I mean, great solutions that you can build with these models available to you just by plugging and play. Text, sound, and, and others. So these are some of the already available for you. And so what is the workflow that you use for creating a solution? So first, 
you'll need to think what you want to create. Um, and with this, you'll need to find the best algorithm, or in this case today, we're going to talk about finding the, fa the, the best model for your use case. And where can I find these ones? Uh, TensorFlow, as I mentioned, has some models. Hugging Face also has uh, an, um, the Transformers API that they use, which does a lot of things. It's not the algorithm. They have a model called Transformers. Also runs on JavaScript. So these two uh, are open source, and you can find some models or algorithms. Uh, algorithms, not the models. Then, now I know what I need to do. Do I have the right data? There's also open data that you can get from Kaggle or from Hugging Face. This is free for you. Getting data is the most complicated part of building the right models. Why? Because with the data that you fill that model is how it's going to work. So we need to be responsible about how we deploy these models with the right data. Uh, in production, right? Um, I heard in that conference, they mentioned how you train your model is the world that it's going to work, right? It's only going to work if you think the world is that way, but you need to look further. So there's a lot of data available for you to, to try in Kaggle and in Hugging Face. After that, you have your data, you need to split it. You need to train with a percentage of that data. You train your model. And then with other percentage, you would verify that it actually works. It should be data that it hasn't seen before, so you can actually evaluate if it's working, right? So um, that's why it's very important to have a lot and enough data. And finally, you'll have your model, and you can deploy it to your application, and it would run uh, whatever um, use case, classification, text, segmentation, and all those things. So I want to show you a quick demo. I've already did a lot of um, wording. Let's go to coding. Um, and let me share, because I think, let me know if you can see it. Oh, I think I need to get out of here. Yep. All right. Is it big enough? Or should I zoom more? All right. Uh, let me close this. Uh, this is a very basic example. Remember, we talk about the prediction of a house. So this is just a script file called TrainJS. In here, I'm importing TensorFlow with TensorFlow.js uh, node. And I have two uh, X and J, and, and Y, sorry. So the first one, let's say, is the number of rooms. So if I have one room, the house may cost, and then you can multiply it by that. And then if the room has two, um, sorry, if the house has two rooms, and so on. So this is how the data simulation would work. You would fill in that data with the, to the model. And then we're going to define the model. So we're going to declare here a variable called model, and then we're going to say uh, tf.sequential. Um, and then we're going to add a layer to that. Uh, if it was a neural network, we will have more layers. But in this case, we're just going to train it with this basic example with just 1D, which is just one array, dimension array. And so um, We're going to compile it using this, um, sorry, uh, yeah. with an optimizer and with a loss. Um, this is very technical into how you might need to train this data. Um, I don't really want to go into the details to not confuse you more. But uh, usually, this is how you would train a very linear regression uh, problem. And then once you compile this, you're basically saying it. What are the algorithms, the, the data shape of your, of your data that you're filling it in? And then we're going to use epochs. This is basically the numbers of times that that data is going to run through this model. So I'm going to put it 100 there. And then the fitting is the place where you actually train this model. So I'm going to put the x and y's that we already defined earlier. I'm going to pass in the epochs. 
And I'm, then I'm gonna, this is gonna be a promise, right? Most of these functions are gonna be promises because uh, once you download the model or once it's finished training, you would have those answers. And then once you finish the training, I'm gonna remember we needed to verify that it's working. So I'm gonna um, predict, ask the model to predict how much a house with five rooms would cost. So I'm gonna pass it here. We need to transform this because um, the model reads data with us in TensorFlow. So you need to translate every input of data. Remember I mentioned you cannot put an image. You need to translate that into numbers. So that's why it's using this one. And then I'm gonna predict here um, the prediction of how, how much it might cost. So I'm just gonna run it real quick. Okay, so. Um, I'm just gonna use no train. This is already in the script, so I just need to run the script itself. As I mentioned, it would run for 100 epochs. So as I mentioned, it's gonna run training. The loss is the, the, the one that it's gonna evaluate. Um, it has to always be uh, going down. So it's finished already. So the, oh, this is so small. So as you can see, the loss is going down, starting from the beginning. Well, I did it maybe 50 would have been okay. But if you, if you see the model is training, the model is improving itself and the loss is going down as it goes to the last epoch. There's gonna be, of course, uh, if you do a lot of epochs, the algorithm would just get as good as it is. So you can do it with 500, but if the algorithm can just do certain uh, modifications on it, it's not worthy. So um, the, most of this, when you do it, it would be mostly about try and error. Uh, how many epochs, how many weights, um, what algorithm should I use? But in this case, it predicted that it would be 3.2. It was gonna be three, so it's not that bad, um, but it's not perfect. Um, because remember, this is predicting. We're always dealing with predictions, not with an answer of how things are. So it wasn't that bad um, for predicting, but then let's talk about a more visual example. And I'm gonna use a um, model called MobileNet. This is an image classifier. This is also open source. Let me just go. Okay, so we're gonna do an image classification. And I'm gonna go to the file. This one, as I mentioned, this is training it from scratch. This is, you will need a little more uh, understanding of what loss functions to use, what optimizers to use. But if you want to just plug and play a model that it's already trained, um, as I mentioned, TensorFlow has a lot. So um, we're gonna be using the mobile net. So in this case, I'm gonna, uh, again, require TensorFlow. I'm gonna import it. And then I'm gonna import the model. As I mentioned, there's also a lot of models on NPM, so you just need to install them. Um, and then we're gonna do a file reading. We, this is something that we'll have on the browser, but we also have this ability on Node. So um, I'm gonna use this one to read uh, uh, an image. This is the function to read uh, the file path. Uh, all the read it for the file system here. Um, okay, here is the image classification function that I want to use. I'm gonna run it in, in the console. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read that image once I already manipulated the image. And uh, I'm gonna use mobilenet.load. As I mentioned, I already imported that and I'm loading it and I'm gonna assign it to mobile net model then I'm gonna assign the predictions to another constant. And that is, if you see, there's a lot of a weight, a single weight. Um, so once I have the model loaded, I'm gonna classify the image that I'm passing through the path. Um, there's the path, the image. So I'm gonna use net.classified and put that image there. 
and then I'm going to console log those predictions. Just make an evaluation that I have the right arguments. Uh, and here is um, the function that I'll be running on the console. I have here two images. One, it's of my cat, and the other one is of one. I just want to make sure you guys see it. So you can see there's a cat, there's wine. So when I ask this model to classify it, uh, so I'm using node, I'm, use, I'm just running the script, and then I'm passing in the cat, which is the path that I mentioned so the model can read it. And the console would be the classifications of that model. So it says, this is the constraint, right? That mobile net has some classifications and that's what I attain to. But if you want to add more, you could use pre, um, transfer learning, right? So it's saying that it could be the probability of it, that it's an Egyptian cat, a tiger cat, a tabby cat, because those are the options that that model has. And it, I think it kind of worked because it's kind of a cat there. And then let's do the one from the wine. So it says red wine, the probability of 99%. So as I mentioned, these are options that you have available and you can translate that to whatever uh, use case you might have in your application. So uh, maybe this might be new for you, maybe not, but let's see what's actually new. Uh, let me just close this real quick. Okay. So, um, so this is the only requirements that I needed for the one of the image classification was just importing those commands um, for my application. What's new? In the Google I.O. in May, they uh, provided, so this was, we run all of this in Node. But what's going on on the browser? This is a product from Google. They're actually building a lot of things because it's their product. And the browser has backends. That means some... Uh, options available for you to run your models. It has the CPU, which is basically where the device or the model is running. There's WebAssembly. This is perfect for models that are small because maybe you don't want to use WebGL because of, uh, of the graphic that it might need. But for models that are bigger, you could use WebGL. And they just release um, WebGPU on your browser, on the most stable Chrome you could use this one. And how can I translate that to requirements? You can run stable diffusion models. Um, the, the test that they did, you could generate an image in 10 seconds when it used to take 30 seconds. So this is something that's happening right now. There's a lot of production um, products right now using browser. Adobe, for example, is using it for object selection within um, Adobe Photoshop. And that's running on the browser. The benefits of being offline and you can use it. Um, actually, Google Meet for the body segmentation, if you have a background, is using the body segmentation model on your browser. So um, the background can move while you're moving in your meeting. This is the graph that they show on May. Um, if you see, this is from 2019 till this year, things are going up. There's people using it. This is actual downloads from the NPM package of TensorFlow. Uh, the only things that are going down is because people was on holidays, but this is going up and it doesn't look like, I mean, they mentioned Jason Mays is the advocate of this library and it's not going down. This means that there's a lot of potential to use it on the browser, right? So, okay, we know browser, but what's going on on the server? Um, Node is fast, and there's actually benchmarks of comparing Python to Node. Node is fast, um, and actually Hugging Face changed one of their uh, models that this still BERT, which comes from BERT, a large, uh, large language model, but using less tokens. And they actually changed it to Node because it was faster. These are the comparisons that they made, um, and it took less 
for this model to run on Node than in Python. So there's benefits and there's use case where we want to use Node um, for machine learning. And what are these use cases? Basically, these are the most common use cases that you'll find, which is running pre-trained models is the easy route, plug and play, and this is what you want to start with. If you want to create a community, they did it well. It's really easy to use these models. Maybe you want to retrain it. Okay, I know how to use them. I just need to retrain it with the data for my use case. That's the other one. And the third one, which is completely from scratch. Um, this might be on the browser, as I mentioned, or in combination, run, if it's a very big model, I can run it on Node. I know JavaScript, and then I can move it to the browser or just put it out there. So we have this capability to do it both ways. With this, JavaScript is not a replacement for Python. This is with a, with what I want to end with. It's not a replacement, but it's a great choice if you're starting with, if you are curious to start using and doing machine learning, this is how I started. I'm not an expert, but this is how I started, and it was easy to move from not knowing anything about it to actually start building stuff. And all of this, um, I learned from really amazing people that are also building a lot of resources for you to start with. Um, some of those are books, some of those are courses. I highly recommend it. Um, you could definitely use deep learning also, but today I'm just talking about machine learning. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you.